I wanted to take a look at some past AMD processors to see what kind of deals we can find. A few years ago, AMD released some processors that were miles better than anything they've ever... Wait, no. That's the 2017 script. <clears throat> Let me see here. Oh, right, the lawsuit. So, <laughs> maybe there was a minor lawsuit involving the 8-core AMD FX series not actually being 8 real cores. But, hey... The 6300 wasn't involved, and that's six whole cores, kinda. So let's see how good of a deal you can get buying used FX series CPUs nowadays. So I went ahead and got three. An FX 6300, my personal one actually, an FX 8120, and an FX 8350. First, the six core FX 6300. This was actually the CPU I got in my first gaming PC back in like 2013. It was about $130 brand new, and nowadays it's going for about $20 to $30 on the used market. Then the FX 8350, which was about about $200 brand new and is now going for around $70 to $90 for a 10-year-old 8-core CPU. And then the 8120, which fit somewhere in the middle of these two, which considering prices of CPUs nowadays brand new, these honestly seemed like a hell of a steal back then, even though they kind of weren't. Uh, I'm really just wondering why people are still buying these for these prices, especially with first-gen rising having similar used pricing. Did AMD actually get something right back in 2011, or are people just absolutely insane. In AMD's fashion, when these first came out, there was some hope in AMD being able to make a decent CPU to go up against Intel's Ivy Bridge. But in reality, even at the time, the initial chips, the 6100, 8120, and 9150, were barely able to keep up with just an i5. And then AMD updated them and released the 6300 and 8350. And well, the gap was closer and the 8350 could actually compete with an i7 in multi-threaded applications. But if you were, I don't know, a gamer, putting a gaming PC with a gaming CPU and wanted single-threaded performance, well, there really wasn't much for you here. And if you actually wanted to use your CPU for work, more than likely you'd be willing to shred the extra money and get a proper HEDT CPU like the 3960X, a 6-core 12-thread CPU that would absolutely destroy the 8350. There is one pretty interesting thing about the FX lineup though. Every single FX CPU was completely overclockable out of the box, and you could push them as high as 5 gigahertz and keep them stable. The motherboard for this build will be my old MSI 970 gaming motherboard from way back in the day. A random boot SSD because obviously, and my first gaming PC case that has seen a better, less dusty days. And a Radeon RX 6600 non-XT. And of course, no budget DDR3 build would be complete without 12 gigabytes of mismatched old RAM. One stick of the DDR3 RAM doesn't work, so we're rocking 8 gigs of DDR3. Now at this point, you're probably asking yourself why I'm using a last gen budget GPU for testing CPUs in gaming. Well, I would respond to that with you clearly were an Intel person back in the early 2010s and are really overestimating the performance of these FX chips. So let's just see if my motherboard even still works. But first, let's try and blow off some of this terrible dust that's been building up since uh, 2015. There we go. That's slightly better, I guess. Sure. Let's just put this thing together. Now we can finally see if my motherboard and CPU still work since I actually haven't tested them in a couple years. Hey, I'm, I mean, I'm not surprised, but... I used this PC like two years ago, like I said, so it should have still worked, at least I'd hope. And even though my 6300 is about 10 years old now, regular Windows use is fine and YouTube can easily play back at 4K. Although the CPU does suck quite a bit of power down when it's just doing small stuff. And my janky, broken, messed up fan that my cat chewed through doesn't really work either, so I'm just gonna go ahead and switch it out for a slightly newer one, which doesn't fit because apparently AM3 isn't widely used anymore, so I had to end up taking the whole thing apart and put it on a test bench and just gently seat my CPU cooler on there with zip ties. So I booted up Steam and hey, the CPU actually could handle installing Steam games pretty well, even though the stock CPU cooler was hitting 70 degrees C before I switched it out. Finally, we can get into it after that complete disaster. First, of course, synthetic benchmarks. Cinebench R23 got a score of 1871 and then later 2156 with a new cooler. Then Blender BMW with only the CPU, no GPU, finished in 22 minutes and 17 seconds. And lastly, I did a test export of my 5D Classic review in 4K and Premiere, that took about 34 minutes. And in terms of gaming, first off, CSGO. High settings actually ran decently at 70 to 100 FPS, but it had some really bad stuttering pretty often. I'd still call it playable, I just don't know if I'd really want to do this competitively. Then I went ahead and tested some emulators. First, Dolphin for Super Mario Sunshine. In Vulcan 720p, it was able to keep a steady 30 FPS with some stuttering here and there. Not too bad. But Twilight Princess was barely able to keep a stable 12 FPS in Hyrule Field, which really isn't playable unless you're in Tasteland and need to execute a frame-perfect trick every frame. 
PCS X2 was able to maintain a solid 60 FPS with some settings adjustments, there's also quite a bit of stuttering. Not quite the best experience in my opinion, but I mean, you might be able to make it work. Minecraft was able to run at a solid 100 to 150 FPS in 1.19.3 at 12 chunks render and simulated with some pretty bad frame drops when loading new chunks and drops to about 60 FPS or so when loading previously loaded chunks. Halo Reach 1080p original settings was able to run pretty well 80 to 100 FPS with dips in the 70s here and there, even with a decent amount of stuff on the screen. Metro Exodus was able to run at 1080p high settings around 50 FPS with some stuttering in the desert, and Doomer Eternal at high settings 1080p was able to maintain 80 to 100 FPS with the GPU sitting around 50 to 60% and the FX 6300 pretty much consistently maxed out, showing the extent of our CPU bottleneck. Halo Infinite had trouble booting and just refused to load the custom game at first, but after trying a couple times I was able to be loaded into the custom game with no other players on a small map. It was able to hit 60 FPS but had a lot of stuttering as you can see on the frame chart. But you could argue this is playable, maybe just not competitively playable. And also not being able to load games is kind of a bummer, which I mean, for $20 that really wasn't too bad, especially being able to somewhat play modern games. But don't forget, these go for $20 to $30 now. But if your budget is $20 and you're building a whole new system, for $20 you could easily grab a Xeon 2690V3, which is 12 cores, 24 threads, and throw that into something like a ThinkStation P500 with the same exact GPU, since the GPU doesn't actually take much power, it'd fit in there. Either way, with that in mind, let's move on to the 8350, which on the used market goes for about $70 to $90, pretty high for an over decade old chip, and that's around the price of a Ryzen 1800X. More on that later. In Cinebench R23, it was able to get a score of 3271, way better than the 6300, and it was able to export my 5D classic review in 27 minutes. Blender BMW took 14 minutes and 23 seconds. Not the greatest scores and times, but hey, $90 CPU, not horrible. Plus you can overclock the absolute hell out of these things, sometimes as high as five gigahertz stable. But with that, let's see if these extra, technically, I guess, two cores improves our gaming experience much. For gaming, CSGO maintained 100 to 130 FPS without any stuttering, a totally playable experience on high settings. Honestly, you really couldn't even tell you're using such an old chip in here. Minecraft ran 120 to 200 FPS, but still had some stuttering loading chunks, but not as quite as bad. Sunshine, with the same settings as before, maintained constant 30 FPS with no stuttering, and Twilight Princess got 12 to 15 FPS in open areas. PCSX2 managed to stay around 60 FPS for Jack 3 and Haven City, with some drops here and there. Overall, extremely playable, and Halo Reach was around 90 to 120 FPS but thankfully had no stuttering and was totally playable. Halo Infinite was finally playable, at least in an empty lobby, getting around 70 to 90 FPS with no stuttering at all, or at least no noticeable stuttering to me. Doomer got 100 to 150 FPS, also had no stuttering, and Metro Exodus was able to maintain a consistent 60 to 70 FPS with no stuttering at all. So overall, pretty good experience, a lot better than the 6300, and if you got a good deal, 30 to 40 bucks instead of 20 to 30 bucks, wouldn't be too bad since I got my 8350 for about 40 bucks. Lastly, the 8120. This came out before the other two chips and it is the weird eight core middle child, since this is before the refresh with the 6300 and 8350 and also kind of priced in the middle of the two of them. And honestly, probably the worst out of all of these chips if I'm being honest, but no spoilers. I'm gonna go a little bit faster for testing though. The first thing I noticed is how much more power it draws over the 6300 or 8350, consistently pulling over 100 watts under load and running a little bit hotter, but not by much. Cinnamon Char 23 was able to get a crazy score of 1816, nearly the same as the 6300 and actually slightly worse than the score I got with the new third-party cooler on the 6300. Premiere, I couldn't even get it to export my 5D classic review. It would just hang indefinitely on the export screen saying it had five minutes left, but I can assure you I left this sitting for over 30 minutes and it only dropped by one second. So I guess AMD just kept up with the lies on these chips for a while. Blender BMW took a long time to even load the test, but when it did load, it finished in 25 minutes and 18 seconds. And in terms of games, CSGO maintained 50 to 60 FPS in areas without many players, but if there were a lot of players on screen, it would be closer to 30 FPS. Not super playable to me without dropping settings, especially if you want to be good at, you know, a competitive FPS game where a lot of people run at 144, 240 hertz. Minecraft was very laggy for multiple minutes, but after it got over whatever problems it had, it maintained 60 to 80 FPS with lots of stuttering, loading chunks, both new and old. Sunshine was same settings as before and wasn't able to maintain a consistent 30 FPS. PCSX2 with Jack 3 couldn't hit 60 FPS and was stuck at 30 and was pretty laggy overall. Halo Reach was stuck around 60 FPS with highs of 80 and a decent amount of stuttering, not great. Halo Infinite got about 60 FPS, but I had a very strange sort of jitter I couldn't explain. It was very odd. I would consider this definitely unplayable. 
especially if you tried to join a game with, I don't know, actual people and not just an empty custom game. Doomer got 100 to 120 FPS, no stuttering here. And Exodus had very, very long loading times, way longer than normal, and ran in the high 40s to low 60s with quite a bit of stuttering. The thing that honestly stood out the most to me is how much stuttering the 81, whatever the hell this is called, I don't remember, <laughs> had in the various games. It's just really odd, and I don't know if maybe it's just my chip, or if the original Bulldozer release was really just that horrible. Either way, performances, I mean, it's all right. I just wish games supported multiple cores as well as this back in 2014 because I would have actually enjoyed having my FX6300, but they didn't and I hated it and I had to get a 4690 to actually play the games I wanted to play. But nowadays at least the 8120 is just not the chip to get. The entire FX lineup is pretty old nowadays and seriously showing its age, especially for the prices that are still being asked on the used market. There is almost no reason to get one of these unless you happen to have an AM3 motherboard and want to throw a slightly higher end CPU in it, like if you have an 8120 and upgrade to an 8350. But if you're building a brand new system from scratch and for some reason want to make an AM3 system, I mean even compared to something like an LGA 1150 or LGA 2011 system, I'm not really sure I could understand the choice, especially when first gen Ryzen is a similar price. And I've recently got myself a Ryzen 1800X for about 80 bucks that is going to be used for a build coming up soon, so subscribe for that by the way. I think it's a really cool build. I really like it. The 1800X, a real 8 core 16 thread CPU released by AMD in 2017. These cost just about as much as the FX 8350 on the second hand market, and just like the 8350 can be overclocked. After swapping over the CPU, which this wouldn't be a budget AMD video with at least one pin being ever so slightly bent, we were able to get over to testing. Starting off with Cinebench, 1800X managed to get just under 7,000, which is significantly higher than even the 8350. Normally I get about 9,000. Cinebench was just having some weird issues for this test, but either way, demonstrated purposes or whatever. Bunder BMW, CPU only, finished in four minutes and 16 seconds, a whole 10 minutes faster than the 8350, our most expensive FX chip. And for the last synthetic bench, my 5D Classic Review exported in just 12 minutes, almost 15 minutes faster than the 8350. Again, for the same price. So far, this is just completely blowing the 8350 out of the water. What if you are only a gamer and don't care about these damn kids nowadays and their synthetic benchmarks, you just want raw gaming performance? Well, CSGO, to start off with, was staying steady at 130 to 160. What the hell am I reading? Well, CSGO was staying steady at around 130 to 160 FPS without any stuttering. Sunshine was a constant 30 FPS, no stuttering, and PCSX2 was able to run full speed with only minor slowdowns. Halo Infinite ran at 100 to 120 FPS with no stuttering, which is finally playable with the 1800X. And in Doomer form, Doom Eternal still ran pretty great, 200 to 250 FPS, and it looks like it's finally starting to get GPU limited with the 1800X. I think you get the point now. AMD's more modern Ryzen 1800X, and by extension the 36 and 3700X, which are similar prices, completely blows the FX series out of the water in nearly every way. And for the same price, yes, you would need to get a newer motherboard and you would need to get newer DDR4 RAM, but I just got 16 gigabytes of DDR4 off eBay for $20 because I made an offer and I got it just for this Ryzen build. And the raw CPU performance is more than double in some instances. And while the 8350 can just barely scrape by nowadays in a lot of these games, just give it a couple more years, a few newer games, and you will be completely out of luck for new AAA games. So don't waste your time thinking you're getting the deal of the century with the fake 8-core CPU. Or if you want something a little bit more built for productivity, check out the 14-core $500 Jank Station build I just did recently. It has some crazy performance. 